You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is, Jacob Volk. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk, and you are not. Firstly, the most important thing, let me apologize for not giving you a show yesterday. My microphone broke. I tried everything I could to fix it. I heard something rattling around in the microphone. So I thought to myself, okay, let me remove that. Maybe that's causing an issue within the microphone. If I can remove that, Maybe the microphone will work. It was a Hail Mary play, but I had to try it. I literally unscrewed the microphone. There were three screws holding the microphone together. I unscrewed all three screws, put Humpty Dumpty back together, and it still wasn't working. Did I have a backup microphone Technically, yes. If you'll recall, during the early part of the pandemic, there were a couple shows that I recorded with my DSLR camera. But that's really a bad substitute. I can't stop recording for anything. Like, if I want to look something up, if someone texts me, if someone calls me, the recording keeps going. That's just how it works. With a normal microphone, it's easy. You just hit the space bar on the computer and that's it. You've stopped recording. You're okay. I mean, the only reason I used that camera was because nothing was open. It's not like I could go to an electronics store and say, I need this microphone. Also, in reality, not a lot happened yesterday in the sports world. There were two stories that I really wanted to talk about. Jaguars, Bengals, I wanted to preview that, and I wanted to talk about Michael A. Taylor signing an extension with the Royals. So can I preview the game? The answer is no, but I can recap it. And I can still talk about the Taylor extension. I mean, I don't know what I was going to do to fill time on that show. Maybe talk about some of the people criticizing Lawrence. Maybe bring it back to the Jets with Zach Wilson. Maybe do the trifecta. Go Baseball Hall of Faming, This Day in Sports History, Mount Rushmore. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I do want to give a shout out to my buddy Mark. He saw my tweet. He texted me, hey, if I know you, you're really ticked off right now. If you want to talk, I'm here. And yeah, I was upset. I did talk to him, which, Mark, if you're listening, I really appreciate it. Thank you for lending me your ear. You didn't have to do that. You know, basically what it boils down to is this. I made a promise to you, the listener, when this show first got started in late December 2019. 
I'm going to break down the latest and greatest in sports every weekday afternoon. And I say that a lot. Regular episodes of the Jacob Volk Show come your way every weekday afternoon. I say that a lot. That's a promise that I make to you. If something arises, okay, life happens. Like I'm allowed to go on vacation. If there's a holiday, that's one thing. But something that's A me issue, something that's preventable, a microphone breaking, I feel bad about that. I mean, in all actuality, I should have had a second microphone. And I did buy two microphones yesterday. I did get the same model, but instead of standing it up on a tripod, I hooked it up to a microphone stand And you'd need to work pretty hard to tip this thing over. I mean, that's what happened. The microphone had just been tipped over one too many times. And it caused something to jar loose. So that was the end of the microphone. Now, I'll say this. It's a lot sturdier. I kind of like this. I really do. So, please accept my apologies. It shouldn't have happened. It was preventable, but... On the bright side, there really wasn't a lot to talk about. If it was gonna happen, let it happen on a day like yesterday and not any day where there's a lot of football and baseball to talk about. Speaking of football, Jaguars-Bengals was a lot more exciting than I think any of us thought it would be. You've got the Jaguars... Leading at the half, 14 to nothing. Should have been 21 to nothing, but Logan Wilson made a really nice play on Trevor Lawrence. With like a minute left in the second half, it was fourth and goal, and Wilson stopped Lawrence from punching it into the end zone. But even then, you felt good about the Jaguars' chances. You would have felt better if it was 21 to nothing, but 14 to nothing? Where the Bengals really couldn't get much of anything going offensively. Evan McPherson missed a 43-yard field goal. You're thinking, this is it. This will end the 18-game losing streak. But the Bengals came storming back in the third quarter. They tied the game at 14. The Jaguars took the lead. With less than a minute elapsed in the fourth quarter. Then the Bengals tied it up again. Then Evan McPherson hit a last second 35-yard field goal. So all in all, the Jaguars outscored the Bengals 14 to nothing in the first half, but in the second half, the Bengals outscored the Jaguars 24 to 7. Maybe it's time to consider something that we haven't been able to say in a long time. Maybe the Bengals are good. Not for nothing, but they're three and one right now. Joe Burrow has been playing really well coming back from that devastating injury that he suffered his rookie season. He had the bad game against the Bears. Okay. Totally get that. 
But the Bears have a good defense. They've got some really good players on that defense. Yeah, it's never good to throw three interceptions on three straight passes, but it's sort of kind of excusable to do it against the Bears. Also, Burrow doing that helped me win my fantasy football matchup that week, so I can definitely forgive him for that. If you take that game out of the equation, Burrow has thrown seven touchdowns to just one interception. He had his best game of the year yesterday. Completed 25 of his 32 passes for 348 yards and two touchdowns. And I'll tell you, he did something yesterday that's very hard for young quarterbacks to do. He rallied the troops and made his team believe that they still had a chance to win that game. You're down 14 to nothing, headed into the locker room at halftime. Nothing's gone your way offensively. It's very tempting to just keel over and die. But the Bengals didn't. The first drive of the second half, it took the Bengals just four plays to score a touchdown. Then the Bengals' defense forced a three and out. Then the Bengals went on a big 12-play drive that resulted in a touchdown. So within the first three drives of the second half, momentum had changed tremendously. That's a very good job by Burrow. Joe Mixon's probably one of the 10 best running backs in the NFL. He wasn't used a ton yesterday. Only had 16 carries for 67 yards. But in all fairness to him, he did average 4.2 yards per carry yesterday. He's averaged 4.3 yards per carry on the season. That's pretty darn good. Jamar Chase looks like the second coming of A.J. Green. Tyler Boyd had a big game. T. Higgins is really good. Although, granted, he didn't play yesterday. C.J. Uzoma had one of his best games ever. Five catches for 95 yards and two touchdowns. Let me ask you something. Would it stun you if in the near future the Bengals made the playoffs? Would that really surprise you? Yes, the AFC North is stacked. You have the Ravens and the Browns. I'm not counting the Steelers because I don't think the Steelers are uh, that good. But would it really surprise you If the Bengals made the playoffs and maybe made some noise there, actually won a playoff game. You know who the last quarterback to win a playoff game for the Bengals is? Boomer Esiason. All due respect to Esiason, he was a really good quarterback. But the last Bengals playoff win happened on January 6th. 1991. That's over 30 years ago. Jeff Blake couldn't win a playoff game for him. Never even made the playoffs with the Bengals. John Kitna never made the playoffs with the Bengals. Carson Palmer couldn't win a playoff game. Andy Dalton couldn't win a playoff game. You get the sense that Joe Burrow could be able to. It really wouldn't surprise me if in the near future the Bengals made some noise in the playoffs. And I like Zach Taylor, for whatever it's worth. 
I think Taylor's gotten a bad rep. Not exactly the most exciting guy in the world. Gridiron Heights did a hysterical parody of him. The Cliff Kingsbury, Kyler Murray, Mandalorian episode. Zack Attack, y'all! <laughs> I mean, look, Taylor didn't have a good year. His first year as a head coach, the Bengals went 2-14. But that got them in position to draft Joe Burrow, to draft T. Higgins. At the time of the injury, Joe Burrow was really playing well. He was starting to hit his stride. It wasn't showing in the record. There's no question. But you could see Burrow getting better and better every week. That's a good look for Taylor. Yes, the Bengals finished 4-11-1, but in all fairness, that's better than 2-14. It's a step in the right direction. It's still not a good season, but the Bengals last year were better than the Bengals the year before. Now the Bengals are 3-1. There's no question about it. The ship is pointed in the right direction. I don't know if I can say the same thing about the Jaguars, though. I mean, not for nothing, but this was a game that they should have won. You're up 14 to nothing after the first half. Victory is in sight. No one watching that game yesterday thought at the half that the Jaguars were going to lose that game. Maybe you thought that the Bengals would make it interesting, but the Jaguars were playing really good football. It was without question their best performance of the season. And not for nothing, but to beat the Bengals in Cincinnati, Urban Meyer returning to Ohio, that would have been a solid win. Not a great win, you still would have been 1-3, and, and it's not like you beat the Chiefs or the Buccaneers or the Bills or the Packers, but still, it would have been a good win. For the Jaguars to lose that game the way they did, it's tough. It's really tough for me to be optimistic about the Jaguars going forward. I'm not saying Trevor Lawrence is a bust. I'm not saying that Urban Meyer can't work in the pros. I think it's too early to say that. But I expected the Jaguars to be a lot better than this. I didn't expect them to be 0-4. I mean, now with the news that DJ Chark fractured his ankle and is going to be out for a really long period of time. How many wins do you really see the Jaguars getting? Maybe four if they're lucky? Okay, four and 13 is better than one and 15. But not for nothing, you draft this generational talent at quarterback, you lure one of the best college coaches in recent history to the NFL. You've got to be better than that. You've got to put up respectable performances. And I don't think being outscored 24 to 7 in the second half is respectable. I don't think giving up a 12-play drive with five and a half minutes left in the game is respectable. I mean, Urban Meyer made some comments after the loss yesterday that really concerned me. He said that the locker room is heartbroken, they're really sad, they're dejected. We've got to get him back. 
And yeah, that's a demoralizing loss, but in the NFL, you can't feel sorry for yourself. 24-hour rule. I understand that those comments were made right after the game, so... It may not have been 24 minutes after the game, let alone 24 hours. But... There's really no point in feeling sorry for yourself. It's just going to end poorly for you. You need to go into every game with the expectation that you're going to win. I don't care if you're 0-13 to start the season like the Jets were last year. Go out and play your hearts out, and maybe just maybe you can win. I understand why the Jaguars were sad. That's a tough loss. That's a really, really tough loss. And again, when you add that to DJ Chark fracturing his ankle, it's tough to be positive about the Jaguars. And not for nothing, that was Trevor Lawrence's best game in the NFL. Which, you know, really says something about his early performance in the NFL. Completing 17 of 24 passes for 204 yards and being responsible for a touchdown. If that's your best performance, you're not going to win. Again, I'm not saying that Lawrence is a bust, but I did expect the Jaguars to be better than this. I didn't expect them to be a good team overall. I didn't expect them to make the playoffs. I expected them to finish with a losing record. But again, I expected them to be better. And for their losses to be respectable. To play respectable football. They have not done that through their first four games. I mean, say what you want about the Jets, but... The loss against the Panthers was a respectable loss. They only lost by five points. They played really well in the second half. They had a chance to win that game. For the Jaguars to blow a 14 to nothing lead at the half by being outscored 24 to 7 in the second half is a really bad look. You have a right to be upset about the loss. I understand in the heat of the moment, you're sad. Totally get that. That's a normal emotion. But next week, dust off your shoulders because you've got a game to play. Granted, you're probably not going to win it because it's against the Titans, but... Anything can happen on any given Sunday. In the immortal words of Herm Edwards, you play to win the game. You can't do that if you're dejected. All right, now it's time for me to make my three NFL picks. I went two and one last week, two and seven overall. But like I said, 2-1 and one last week, so I'm on the right track. Hopefully I can keep up my winning ways. Although I will say I had a really tough time making picks for this week's games. I'm not making any excuses, I just had a tough time. But I did find three that I like. I like the Browns minus two over the Vikings. I don't think the Vikings are that great. You've heard the rumors about Mike Zimmer being on the hot seat. And Dalvin Cook is questionable. He's still dealing with that ankle injury. So even if he plays, he's not going to be at 100%. And I understand that Alex Madison looked really good last week against the Seahawks. 
but the Browns defense is better than the Seahawks defense. The days of the Legion of Boom are long gone. I think the Browns will win by at least a field goal. So give me the Browns minus two. As for the underdog pick, I like the Patriots plus seven against the Buccaneers on Sunday night football. I think the Patriots are going to lose this game. But, I think it's going to be close. When I say close, I mean like a field goal difference. Maybe two. A touchdown and an extra point doesn't work for me. I see the Patriots really, really keeping this game close. Tom Brady's first game back in New England as a Buccaneer? I mean, that is must-see TV. The Patriots know that the entire sports world is going to be watching. Realize, all the baseball games are going to be over. All the football games are going to be over. I just don't see the Patriots losing by seven. I think the Buccaneers will win, but I think it'll be by less than seven points. So give me the Patriots plus seven, and give me Washington minus one and a half over the Falcons. I just don't think the Falcons are that great. They really didn't impress me against the Giants. I mean, granted, Washington isn't a great team either, but I think they're better than the Falcons. I just think they're more talented than the Falcons. Minus one and a half is basically a pick And I think Washington is going to win this game. I've got to go with the football team. So my picks are Browns minus 2, Patriots plus 7, and Washington minus 1.5. Alright, now I'll give you some college football vault talk. And I'll start with Arkansas, Georgia. Two excellent SEC teams... Alabama gets all the attention because they're Alabama. But these two teams are fantastic. They're incredibly well-rounded. You've got Arkansas's excellent option offense going up against Georgia's excellent defense. The one caveat there is that K.J. Jefferson is questionable with a knee injury. You gotta think that he'll push through it. I mean, I'd be stunned if he missed this game, but Malik Hornsby is the Razorbacks' backup quarterback. He is more than capable of leading the offense. Like I said, it's an option offense. Really doesn't rely a lot on downfield passes. It's your typical college offense. You don't need a great quarterback running it. Hornsby will do fine. Meanwhile, JT Daniels has a back injury. He's probable, but not for nothing. You want to be at 100% when you're going up against this Arkansas defense. Like, I'd rather Hornsby play Because I don't want a hobbled Jefferson going up against the Bulldogs defense. 
Daniels not being at 100% concerns me a little bit. Because the Razorbacks have a great defense. Both teams have defenses too good for me to go through individually. They're arguably the two best defenses in the nation. I mean, if I go through everyone, we'll be here until Christmas. So will Daniels be effective against the Razorbacks? Yeah, but the back injury does concern me. A little bit. I think this is going to be a low scoring game. The over under is 50. Take the under. The Bulldogs are 18 point favorites. Arkansas is covering that spread. Arkansas is a great team. Arkansas is incredibly underrated. Make no mistake about it, Arkansas has a chance to win this game. But with it being in Georgia, it's hard for me to pick against the Bulldogs. Even if Daniels doesn't play that well, Stetson Bennett is putting together a good season. And Lord knows they have the running game necessary to carry the load by themselves. Amir White, James Cook, and Kendall Milton. It wouldn't stun me if the Razorbacks won. I love Arkansas this year. I really, really do. But picking against Georgia in Georgia is incredibly tough. Give me the Bulldogs in a very close game. Moving on now to Cincinnati, Notre Dame. I haven't spoken a lot about Cincinnati this year, except to say that Arkansas is better than them. And I stand by that. But this is a good Cincinnati team. Luke Fickle has done an excellent job with that program over the years took over for Tommy Tuberville and has whipped the Bearcats into shape. They're a really, really good team. Offensively, there are only two names that you need to know. Desmond Ritter and Jerome Ford. Ritter is one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the nation. He's completed 65.1% of his passes for 748 yards. He's thrown seven touchdowns and two interceptions. And Jerome Ford is one of the best running backs in the nation that no one talks about. He's averaging six yards a carry this year. 50 carries for 300 yards and six touchdowns. They're one of the best Quarterback, running back duos in the nation. But don't look past the Bearcats' defense. Their front seven is one of the best in the nation. Curtis Brooks, Malik Van, Darian Beavers, Jawan Briggs, Deshaun Pace, Wilson Huber, and Joel Dublanco are really, really good. Good players. Meanwhile, you look at Notre Dame. They had a tougher time against Wisconsin than the score would indicate. But their defense did an excellent job in forcing Graham Mertz into a lot of mistakes. I've spoken glowingly about their defense in the past. Again, too many guys to go through. I'll say this, though. Jack Cohn is a little banged up. He's probable to play. But him not being at 100% does scare me against this Bearcats front seven. The thing is, though, this game is at Notre Dame. 
It's very tough to beat Dame in South Bend. I think overall Notre Dame is better than Cincinnati. Notre Dame has a really good offensive line. Guys like Josh Lugg, Jarrett Patterson, and Kane Madden are really good players. They'll give Cone time to work through his progressions and get the ball to guys like Michael Mayer, Kevin Austin, and Avery Davis. I've got to go with the Fighting Irish here. Moving on now to Ole Miss versus Alabama. This is the first time that I get to talk about Matt Corral. According to Mel Kuyper, Corral is the best quarterback in this coming draft. I gotta tell ya, I really like Sam Howell. At this very moment, I'd probably put Howell ahead of Corral, but Corral has a lot of talent. It wouldn't surprise me in the slightest if by April, Corral leapfrogs Howell on my board. I mean, I like Corral. Don't get me wrong. He's very aggressive, but makes very smart decisions. He hasn't thrown an interception all year. The thing with him, and I don't want to go too far down the draft rabbit hole, but he's helped a lot by a great offensive line. The Rebels probably have one of the best O-lines in the nation. Arguably the best. You think about guys like Nick Broker, Jeremy James, Ben Brown, and Caleb Warren. Those are excellent players. Of course, the one thing that Corral does that Howell doesn't is... He runs. Corral is a very mobile quarterback. Howell is more of a pocket passer. And the NFL is moving towards mobile quarterbacks. So I feel like it's going to be a fun battle to watch as we go through the process. Watching these guys play this year watching their bowl games, watching their combine performance, watching their pro days. It'll be fun. Defensively, the guys you need to look out for from Ole Miss are Sam Williams, Chance Campbell, Otis Reese, Jalen Jones, Taishim Johnson, Tarikius Tisdale, Isaiah Eaton, Cedric Johnson, Quentin Bivens, and Kadron Smith. Everyone talks about the Ole Miss offense because Lane Kiffin's their coach. And Kiffin's a very smart offensive mind. But their defense is very, very good. Nowhere near as good as the Bama defense, but still, it's good. Alabama's defense is one of the best in the nation. All misses isn't. You think about guys like Fedarian Mathis, Will Anderson Jr., Drew Sanders, DJ Dale, Brian Branch, and Jordan Battle. They're just more dominant than the Ole Miss players. Maybe Ole Miss's defense is better as a whole, but Alabama has the more dominant players. The thing is, though, no one's paying attention to Alabama's defense because Bryce Young looks absolutely sensational. I mean, Young is currently leading the SEC in touchdowns. 
He's thrown 15 of them to just one interception. And he's already gone up against good teams. Miami of Florida is a solid team. The Gators are a really good team. That's the knock on Corral to me. Who has he played? Louisville isn't great. Tulane is terrible. These next two games are going to go a long way towards proving what Corral is. Because he's going up against Alabama and Arkansas in back-to-back weeks. Ball out in those two games. And yeah, we've got something here. Until I see Corral play against a great defense... It's impossible for me to say that he can lead an upset. Again, this is nothing against Corral. I really like him. I see the talent. I'm not knocking him. I don't blame Mel Kuyper for saying that he's the best quarterback in the draft. But, as of right now, to me, it's Sam Howell. Let's see what Corral does against Alabama and Arkansas. I'll be rooting for Corral to play well. There's no question. But he's got to prove it first. Until he does, I've got to pick Alabama. The last game to talk about is Baylor versus Oklahoma State. You remember what I just said about Corral not playing anyone good? That statement holds for Baylor. Baylor has probably the worst strength of schedule out of any of the Power 5 teams. They beat Texas State, Texas Southern, and Kansas. They also beat ISU. Now, I understand that ISU was ranked at the time that those two teams met. And I don't think ISU is a bad team, but they're not a great team either. Like, I don't look at them as a CFP contender. I think they're a good team. I think they're a solid team. Not great. So it's very hard to evaluate Baylor. How good are they, really? I mean, Jerry Bohannon is having a good season. He's completed 73% of his passes for 828 yards and 7 touchdowns. He hasn't thrown an interception. And the Bears certainly have a great running game with guys like Abram Smith, Treston Ebner, Tay McWilliams, and Bohannon. And R.J. Sneed and Tyquan Thornton are very talented wide receivers, but it's very, very tough to evaluate this Baylor team. Three games against cupcake teams and one game against a good team, maybe a very good team if I'm being generous, because I like Rock Purdy and Brees Hall, it's tough to evaluate the Bears. Yes, their offensive line has been fantastic this year, but they haven't played a great defense. Yes, their defense has been really good, but they've only faced one good offense. That was ISU. It's just impossible to properly evaluate this Bears team. It's a lot easier to evaluate Oklahoma State. And when I look at the Cowboys... I see a really good team. I see a core of skill position players that make their good, not great quarterback in Spencer Sanders look a lot better than he actually is. Guys like Jalen Warren, Tay Martin, Brennan Presley, Jaden Bray, and Rashad Owens are incredibly talented skill position players. 
And the Cowboys' defense is incredibly talented. Guys like Jaden Jernigan, Malcolm Rodriguez, Tyler Lacey, Sione Asi, Jarek Bernard Converse, Christian Holmes, Colin Oliver, and Colby Harvell Peel are really talented players. I know who the Cowboys are. They're a very good team. I don't know who the Bears are. I know that they've looked great against the three cupcake teams, but against ISU, they weren't great. I mean, ISU had every opportunity to win that game. I just don't know who the Bears are. We're going to find out who they are tomorrow. It wouldn't stun me if Baylor won, but I got to go with Oklahoma State. I'll close this show out by breaking down the signing that I wanted to talk about yesterday. That is the Royals signing Michael A. Taylor to a two-year extension worth $9 million. And I really like this move. I like Taylor as a backup outfielder. Has good speed. A solid bat. And he can play all three outfield positions. Granted, he's only played center for the Royals this year, but he's played the corner outfield positions in the past. I mean, look, Taylor hasn't turned into the superstar that everyone thought he would as he was working his way through the Nationals minor league system. Before the 2015 season got underway, Taylor was looked at as a consensus top 60 prospect. So yeah, it's a little disappointing that he's topping out as a backup outfielder, but at least he made it. There's a role for Taylor in the league, that's all I can say. The thing is, though, the Royals have had him starting in center field. You don't want Taylor being your everyday starter in center field. That's just not going to end well. I mean, this year, Taylor's hitting 244 with 12 homers and 52 RBIs. That's fine for a backup, not for a starter. He also has 14 steals, and he's been caught stealing six times. Again, good for a backup, not a starter. I'd like the Royals to really address their outfielders going forward. I don't want Taylor starting. Four and a half mil per year is fine for a backup. So... If I'm looking at this as the Royals are keeping a backup around, great move. If they sign him to this extension with the premise that he's going to continue as their starting center fielder, I have an issue with that. He's just not a good starting outfielder. I don't know who the Royals can get to replace Taylor. They traded for Andrew Benintendi last year. No one saw that coming. And Benintendi put together a good year for the Royals. 275, 17 homers, 71 RBIs. That was pretty good. See, the thing with the Royals is they're not as far off as you think they are. They have a solid lineup. Salvador Perez is having one of the best seasons that a catcher has ever had. 
Whit Merrifield is one of the most underrated players in baseball. Same thing with Nicky Lopez. Benintendi is good. Hanser Alberto is good. Kyle Isbell in limited time has looked good. There's work to do in the Royals lineup. Don't get me wrong, but they have a solid core. The thing is, though, their pitching is just dreadful. I'm not in love with their bullpen. Scott Barlow, Josh Stallmont, and Jake Brent are solid relievers. After that, it falls off a cliff. But then, once you get to the rotation, it is dreadful. Mike Miner had a bad year. Same thing with Brad Keller. Same thing with Brady Singer. Same thing with Chris Bubich. Same thing with Daniel Lynch. Danny Duffy had a good year, but he got hurt. Like, the thing with the Royals is... They have this young group of pitchers, but how good are they? You'd like to think they have potential, and they do, but at the end of the day, they've got to realize it. None of them did last year. That's why the Royals finished at under 500. If those guys reach their full potential... Maybe the Royals could make some noise in the AL Central. They wouldn't be better than the White Sox, but they could have finished in second place. That would have been pretty darn good for a team that hasn't finished in at least second place since 2015. That hasn't finished over 500 since 2015. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens with the Royals going forward. They have guys with potential. For their sake, I hope they can reach it. But all in all, the Michael Taylor extension is a good move. I just hope he's not a starter for them. Next year. Monday is going to be a little interesting. You're going to get a New York Jets recap that morning. I'm going to the Yankees game on Sunday, so can't give you a recap right after the game. So I'll do it Monday morning. That'll be fine. I'll have watched the game by then. So it'll be fine. Regular episodes of the Jacob Volk Show come your way every weekday afternoon. Monday night, I'm going to put a bow on the Yankees season. I will say this. It is still technically possible that the Yankees will play the wild card game in Boston. It's unlikely, but it's still a possibility. If that's what happens, you're not going to get a show on Tuesday. But I feel confident in saying that the game will be in the Bronx. I don't know who it's going to be against. The Mariners, Red Sox, or Blue Jays. But regardless, you'll get a show that day. I'll go to the game... I just won't need to do anything crazy transportation-wise. Also, Friday's a little interesting. On that day's regular episode of the Jacob Volk Show, you're going to get an interview that I'm going to do with John Vandemore. He was Stanford University's sailing coach during... The whole Lori Laughlin, Felicity Huffman admission scandal. Operation Varsity Blues. I'm going to talk to him about his book, Rigged Justice. 
how the college admissions scandal ruined an innocent man's life. Sadly, I'll only have 10 minutes with him. That was the best I could do. I tried to get 15. I tried to get 20. I could only get 10. It'll still be an interesting interview. I just wish it was longer. That night, if the Yankees don't make it to the ALDS, if they fall off a cliff this weekend against the Rays, or if they lose the wild card game, you'll get my off-season preview. I need to give myself a lot of time to think about what's best for the Yankees going forward because there are a million different directions that they can go in. I hope all of that made sense. If it didn't, don't hesitate to reach out. Hit me up on Twitter, at RealJacobVolk. Leave a comment on YouTube. Do whatever you need to do. Until next time, I'm Jacob Volk. And always remember, if you disagree with me, you're wrong.